finish up 10.1, we're going to explore some of the simplification that we can do with our square and cube roots, mostly. We'll still touch on some of the others as well. So, I talked about how we can get kind of creative with our exponents here. This idea of x to the sixth, we know that that's the same as x cubed squared. We know that something raised to a power raised to another, we can multiply those powers to simplify. So the square root of t to the sixth here, really, this is the same as the square root of t cubed squared. Now those two can cancel for me. We've got t cubed. So the deal here with not having absolute values involved comes from the fact that we can know um, what is and isn't going to be positive. So when I simplify this, when I get those all canceled, it's the same idea as going through and if this were negative, the square would have made it positive. So when I cancel those, I can know that we're good to go with positive here. All right. So extending how my exponent rules affect my square roots just the same, I can say the cube root of 64 times the cube root of y to the 12th. Just like if this were to the third power, and I could distribute it to the terms because it's multiplication. Remember, it has to be multiplication. We can't have addition or subtraction. I can distribute the square root or the cube root just the same. Cube root of 64 is, what is that, 4? No. Yeah, it's 4. Our cube root of, nine to the of y to the 12th is going to be, well, y to the 12th is the same as y to the 4th cubed. And those are canceling. We've got 4 to the 4y to the 4th. So you may notice a bit of a pattern popping up here. And we'll talk about the why of that later. But the pattern is that when I go through this process of taking it apart to simplify, the value that I end up with here is this exponent divided by the index. 12 divided by 3 is 4. 6 divided by 2 is 3. And that's really a pattern that happens. It is true. It is the case. There's no exceptions that happen with that. So, same thing. I can distribute this to the top and the bottom, just like I could an exponent. Good to cancel. We've got x over y. Same thing happens here, where I can distribute that fifth root to the top, fifth root to the bottom, get that negative back out front. I can distribute the fifth root to my factors up here. We'll leave that as it is for now. And now I can think about simplifying. The fifth root of 32 is 8. Those are canceling. We've got 8a b to the 10th, if I stick with that pattern, 10 divided by 5, is 2. 
So what about our Pythagorean theorem? That's probably the most familiar instances instance you have of using square roots. So it's also a good example of why we default to the principle. If I use my Pythagorean theorem, I've got that 12 squared plus b squared equals 15 squared. 12 squared is 144. 15 squared, I should know that one. It's 225. Subtract my 144 over. We get 81. Then you would have square rooted both sides. B is 9 centimeters. And so this is a good demonstration of why we have the principal square root. Both so that we can force our square roots to be functions where they only put out one value. And when I'm talking about lengths here, a negative length doesn't make any sense. So I have 9 centimeters. If I continue working with the old Pythagorean theorem, we've got two cars leaving the same place at the same time. One goes west 40 miles an hour. The other goes north at 30. Let's redraw that. I didn't read ahead and I was thinking it was going to go south. So we're going 40 miles per hour to the west, 30 to the north. How far apart are they after two hours? Well, if this goes 30 miles every hour, they've gone 60 to the north. If this is going 40 miles every hour, it's got 80 to the west. So how far apart are they? Exactly, we're thinking as the crow flies here. Well, it's our Pythagorean theorem. 60 squared plus 80 squared is our distance here, C squared. 60 squared, oops, 60 squared plus 80 squared is 10,000. The square root of 10,000 is 100. So they're 100 miles away from each other. Okay, so radical functions. I talked about how we part of the principal root is for the sake of a function, and we can look at that on a graph to really see uh, pretty much why. So let's take a visit back to domain first. So when we talked about domain, we said the two things that we were worried about were the square roots of something negative and something divided by zero. We're going to really look at this one and its full implications here. So if we go by that, avoiding the negatives underneath here, if we remember on one side of zero, we have our positive values. On the other side, we have negative. So if I figure out what x puts me right here, I can know that one side of that x is OK. The other side is a problem. The other side would cause us to have a negative underneath there. So I would say negative 5 is the x that puts me right there. Negative 5 plus 5 gets me a 0 underneath my square root. I just need to decide which side of that negative 5 is going to give me a positive and which side is going to cause me the problems with the negative. And I like to do test points for this try 0 out. If I plug 0 in, 0 plus 5 
is positive. So because 0 is greater than negative 5, we know that that side that 0 came from, the values greater than negative 5, are OK. And the ones below it are a problem. So if we expand this idea of avoiding the square roots of negatives to our different nth roots, we have to pay attention to whether or not, whether the index is positive or, or not positive, whether the index is odd or even. So we're okay with cube roots of negatives. If I come over here and ask my calculator, what is the cube root of negative 8? Oops, wants a negative, not a subtraction. It tells me that it's negative 2. It's okay with having a negative underneath there. Same is true for all of your odd indices. So I'm not worried about a negative underneath a radical that has an odd index. If I'm not worried about that negative, then everything's fine and dandy. I could have negative infinity to infinity as my domain. If I have an even index, it follows the exact same rules and the exact same process as a square root. I need to avoid a negative underneath this radical. So I'm going to find what makes it 0. Well, if a were 1 half, 1 half times 2 is 1, 1 minus 1 would be 0. And just like up here, I'm got to, I have to decide if the stuff above 1 half or below it is the way to go. And I like to test 0. 0 is real quick and easy. 2 times 0 is 0. 1 minus 0 is 1. So the side of 1 half that 0 came from is the one that's okay with me. Well, 1 half is greater than 0, so we're going to choose everything that's less than 1 half. And remember, I put square brackets on 1 half and negative 5 because I'm all right with the square root of 0. I'm okay with the fourth root of 0. They're 0. That's not a problem. It's the negatives themselves I'm trying to avoid. So, let's take a look at a graph. The domain here is going to be the same process. I'm looking at a square root. I'm looking at an even index. So I know that my domain is going to be limited by trying to avoid negatives underneath there. Well, 3 is what makes it exactly 0. I just have to decide if I like the values above 3 or the ones below it. I do that by testing out 0 up here. 3 minus 0 is 3. 3 is positive, so the side of 3 here that 0 came from is the side that I want. I know everything from negative infinity to 3 is OK in my function here. And I can use that to make my table of ordered pairs. So I always told you to center around 0, try some stuff below it, try some stuff above it. This time around, we're going to try to go a little bit smarter about our values. I'm going to start with 3 itself. And I just established here that the values above 3 are a problem. Plug 4 in there, I get a negative underneath. Plug 100 in there, I get a negative underneath. So I'm going to start at 3, and I'm just going to keep going lower than that. Let's go 2, say negative 1, and we'll go negative 6. So you'll see why I chose these in a moment. If I plug 3 in up here, we already decided that that makes 0. The square root of 0 is 0. If I plug 2 in there, 3 minus 2 is 1. Square root of 1 is 1. 3 minus negative 1 is going to be 3 plus 1. 
So 4, the square root of 4, is 2. 3 minus a negative 6, so 3 plus 6, is 9. The square root of 9 is 3. So I personally chose those more unusual values because I was shooting for getting a perfect square underneath my square root. But now let's graph. So over 3, up 0. Over 2, up 1. Back 1, up 2. Back 6, up 3. A little higher than that. And so I know my graph is going to look like this. Notice that I have a real hard stop right here. I didn't try and guess some kind of trend off this way because I know my domain stops here. There isn't any graph over there. Anything above positive 3 is outside of my domain. And this is a good time to look at why we don't have, or why we go for the principal root when we're dealing with our even roots. So all of your even indexed roots will look something like this. Look some kind of swoop off to the left or the right. It might be going down, it might go down that way, whatever. And the reason we go with our principal is because if I considered both, I would have it mirrored down here. That wouldn't pass my vertical line test. I wouldn't have a function. And so you might notice that this is really a parabola on its side. And that's what our roots end up doing, is they take the original graph and turn it onto its side. If I did a cube root, well, our typical cubic graph looks like this. Oops, looks like that. A cube root looks like that. Basically the same thing, just turned over to its side. All right, so that is it for 10.1. We're going to get started on 10.2 tomorrow.